What's up, everyone? Here with Berry Flow Upstream number 31. Got the Berry Flow regulars on as well. We've got Crackberries Blaze. How you doing today, Chris? Not too bad. Yourself? Doing well. Alex, how you doing tonight? I am doing good. Just finishing off my last bite of uh, food, so ignore me. <laughs> <You're> good, though. <laughs> <laughs> you can mute yourself as you chew. Darius, how's it going on your end, buddy? I'm, I'm all right, I guess. Cowboys lost, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to we don't want to bring you down on that, so we won't even we won't even mention the Packers tonight. <laughs> Everyone, feel free to flood the comments right now. <laughs> Jubei, how you going? I'm doing all right. I'm all a lot better now that the Cowboys lost. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be awful. <laughs> oh no! How's it going on your end, dude? Everything's good. I'm just chilling. We're following up a week of CES 2015. Lots of interesting stuff. It was a little bit louder for BlackBerry and QNX as opposed to some of their other uh, ventures over at CES. I believe last year they were kind of hiding out in the background, letting QNX take a lot of the forefront, but they actually had BlackBerry there with their own announcement. First day of CES, they were showing off a lot of the car stuff, lots of cool stuff. We're talking 50 million vehicles running some kind of QNX embedded infrastructure, be it the car platform, be it the infotainment system, be it the acoustic technology that QNX is known for. But really cool to see that proliferation. What do you guys think about those numbers, 50 million in cars in 2015 as we move forward? I think it's good to have the, those numbers out there, but um, as we were saying you know, before we hopped on air, you know, if 50 million, it's, it's obviously a milestone for them at that point in time. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's still work to be done to actually push the QNX name out there among people who actually, you know, want to hear about it, like us BlackBerry fans and stuff like that. Because the normal average person doesn't necessarily know that their, you know, CarPlay system, which obviously most people relate to Apple, is, you know, could possibly be powered by QNX, which is a subsidiary of BlackBerry underneath. It's a, same with Android um, Auto, you know. Most people don't necessarily know that, so they're, you know, 50 million is is an impressive number, but you still have to let other people know that, you know, BlackBerry is still powering that system. Which begs the question, what a lot of you know, a lot of readers, given off of what Chris just said, should have uh, BlackBerry renamed QNX or somehow tie in. The logo a little implemented a little bit more so people can it's it's instilled in people's mind that QNX is synonymous with BlackBerry. Should they get rid of the name? It's a lot of people that are debating whether or not BlackBerry should make that move. What do you think about that? I I mean uh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we've brought it up many times before. They slowly like started implementing QNX. Like I think the first thing they did was they made like the QNX logo flat. It used to be like more of a 3D or something. And then they added the little BlackBerry logo there. And I think, you know, they initially did it because they didn't want to mud, you know, muddy the waters, whatever that saying is, with throwing BlackBerry all over QNX because QNX was doing great by itself. So when people start having this negative connotation about BlackBerry at the time and they hear QNX, I think it was real dangerous. And I think they played it out well. And why not wait for them to just QNX to grow much larger, and then if they did want to do some kind of huge play on it, then do it then. I think you know they're they're still at the stage where they're just letting QNX get in everywhere before they you know risk saying you know QNX is BlackBerry and doing all that stuff. But they're letting people know that QNX is BlackBerry. And to Alex's point, you know he those subtle changes and implementations that they have been going through. If you actually look at the press releases, like some of the earlier press releases that BlackBerry put out, there's no there's no mention of BlackBerry in those actual QNX press releases. But now, especially all, I noticed in all of the ones from CES, it says, you know, QNX, a subsidiary of BlackBerry Limited. It specifically lays it out. It doesn't just simply say QNX anymore. They, they just added that a subsidiary of BlackBerry Limited into each and every single press release. So anybody reading the press release at that point is gonna, you know, see that stuff and hopefully it'll raise some questions and cause them to look look into it a little bit further if they're actually interested. In it. it also makes you kind of wonder a little bit, like, 
uh, you know, with BlackBerry, if they were to, you know, kind of just X out the name Q and X, what what do they name? I mean, because you have BlackBerry, you have BlackBerry Legacy OS, and then you have BlackBerry 10, uh, you know, OS. If you take, you know, Q and X away from, it's kind of like, what do you, what, what will BlackBerry name it as well? Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that BlackBerry also could kind of run into issues with in trying to, you know, separate that uh, OS from BlackBerry 10 OS. You know, of course, I mean, you can push, you know, the legacy OS to the side, but trying to, you know, difference, differentiate, you know, the two OSs, I think is also kind of... That's a, a, yeah, that's a really good point because uh, you're talking about a lot of money it's going to take for them right. to brand that division, and QNX is already has its own... Um, identity. On, on, yeah, its own identity. Uh -huh. And, it, you know, BlackBerry is the umbrella, and uh, everything underneath it, you know, uh, represents it. Yeah, uh, and then the other question is, I mean, how much more value will BlackBerry stock or you know uh, just perceptive value will increase if they did make such a move and rename QNX something else or just made BlackBerry more relevant? Would that really, really matter? Would that really? I don't think it would matter at all. I love I love that quote from I love that quote from Chen where he's like you know you're not gonna rename your kid if he's doing bad in school. <laughs> you know? I, I keep going back there on the renaming side, yeah. but I like to see a little bit more semblance of division between Q and X. They have Q and X Medical, Q and X Automotive, maybe Q and X Mobile, BB10. We start licensing some of that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'd love to see at least a little bit more expansion and clarity on that end, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I need to switch the bitchness off. <laughs> Killing me, man. <laughs> I thought what was cool is that again at CES they they showed off that they have a lot of support in terms of the actual chip makers like Qualcomm and Nvidia both sporting that they're building you know chips that are going to be able to work in the vehicle. I thought that was pretty cool to show again the scalability and kind of openness of the whole car platform for building terms and development purposes. Yeah, the the Nvidia announcement actually surprised me, like because not only. Not only because it's NVIDIA, of course, but there has been a relationship there in the past. But NVIDIA was one of the, uh, you know, they were one of the first people that were up on CES. They essentially opened CES. That's kind of like their thing. They open CES each year with their keynote. So we actually got to go ahead and see a part of the QNX announcements before even QNX announced that they were working with NVIDIA because QNX or NVIDIA got on stage and demoed it right there. So that was that was absolutely interesting to me. I don't know why it was so fascinating, but it just it was one of those things that stuck out because they essentially opened CEA at CES by talking about BlackBerry stuff. I was like, oh wow, this is cool. And it took me by surprise. I'm like, yeah, let's get a post up about that. So that was cool stuff. It, it kind of makes you wonder as well, you know, how, you know, BlackBerry, in, in partnership with uh, Qualcomm in their chips, how, you know, it, maybe there could be some kind of, you know, collaboration with NVIDIA, BlackBerry, and, and Qualcomm, their chips, and, and, you know, what they could do further down the line as well with, you know, devices, whether it be, you know, mobile devices or in, in uh, the health spectrum, uh, so to speak. I mean, it's just... It, it kind of seems like that BlackBerry's making, like, all the right partnerships, and they're not making... Yeah acquisitions or partnerships that are just like uh, because we feel like in the future we could do, we could dabble in this you know uh, in over here or we could dabble with this and you know so have you I, like they're really kind of putting all their ducks in a row and they're taking their time with things but it all makes sense because you kind of see where they're trying to go in the future with health um, uh, man health and um, tons of other you know products that they have I mean that is we're just kind of just waiting to be unveiled but um, it, it really makes you excited. It really makes you eager to want to see what they have coming as well. I mean, getting getting me excited was that Maserati. That thing was absolutely yeah. gorgeous. I mean, I really love the, I guess, the digitization of the, the different mirrors. So all of them were basically just cameras in a display. I wonder if, like, that's the future of the windshield, that the windshield is not so much a clear piece of glass as it is just a screen with some videos on the front, so you're watching you're watching the road through a camera in real time. I wonder what kind of right, like, and how do you get that past like the the different compliance layers that they're gonna have for it, you know? And really, QNX is gonna be at the forefront of that, right? This is one of the most secure operating systems for this type of automation that's out there, and they've got all kind of the HIPAA compliance that they need to really be able to be there in a secure way. Definitely looking forward to it. 
what else did you guys like in terms of Q&X and some of their announcements at CES? I mean, they also announced some stuff with LG, Volkswagen. They mentioned that they're also going to be running LTE inside Chevy's vehicles. Yeah. I thought that all of that's really, really, really cool stuff. I mean, bringing LTE to the car in a connected, you know, holistic way is pretty awesome. Definitely integrated drive stuff is a it's lot cool. to look forward to. Yeah, it seemed like BlackBerry is starting to have some creative fun in the process, right, and kind of flexing their ability to be um, just versatile in what they can offer and compatible with everything. That's some, that's one of their strongest points. Uh, there's nothing really so proprietary about it, and um, BlackBerry seems to now is trying to expand on that and really increase that value that we are the uh, defining technology for infotainment and for you know car computers and stuff like that. So where they're gonna you know leverage that in the future and making you know more income, don't know yet, but. Um, like we said, we, we talked about it, you know, with, with, with uh, Chris, it just, you know, 50 million cars, we, we see all these demonstrations, all nice, very impressive, but the actual revenue that they get from the QNX division isn't exactly uh, that strong. So, got to wait and see. Um, you know, first things first, you know, obviously you establish yourself as a dominant force in the market, and then once you have that foothold, then you can use that to uh, take it somewhere. I love that Yahoo interview that he did, and you know she's like, "What's it gonna take to get BlackBerry to the forefront?" Chen is like, "No, we we are at the forefront," <laughs> you know, and it's cool that they are leading in that regard. Definitely some cool stuff coming out of QNX. I'm glad that they continue making concept cars. I love seeing them every year. And yeah. CES, it just kind of gets the year started, you know. Definitely yeah. cool. Definitely cool. Chris, tell us about this poll you guys did over at CrackBerry in terms of how you scroll. I thought it was pretty interesting that James tossed that up there. What are some of the results? Uh, yeah, well, for those who don't know, James uh, did up a, a poll asking, you know, how do you actually use your BlackBerry Passport? You know, th because where the Passport has uh, the touch-sensitive keyboard, a lot of people have become accustomed to actually just using the keyboard to navigate, or, you know, do you actually reach out and, and use the touch touchscreen as well? And according to some of the results, uh, BlackBerry Passport users, they the majority, 52.97%, actually use a mix of both. So they're using the keyboard, they're using the touchscreen as well. 29.77% uh, use the keyboard alone, which is rather interesting because, again, you know, it where it, the keyboard is touch sensitive and you can scroll directly using just the keyboard, it's interesting to see how many people actually reach out and touch it and don't touch it. 17.26% um, uh, which came in obviously last would uh, rather use the key uh, the screen rather than actually using the keyboard which again that's just absolutely interesting numbers because of the various ways that you can navigate through the OS and scroll around and stuff like that. That was my point with the passport. It was like I wanted to j solely use the keyboard for everything, but you yeah. do have this massive touch screen. Why not take advantage of it? Ronell, if in taking that poll, how did you find yourself using your passport? Were you using more f in terms of scrolling? Were you using more of the touch screen, or were you actually dedicated using the touch-enabled keyboard? Um, I have to go with everybody else and using both. I mean. It's something which my hand is always going back to the screen, always, and when I'm in the hub or I'm in browsing, I'll use the, the keyboard for scrolling most of the time, but everywhere else it would be the screen, right? So it's just a matter of where I am and what I'm using it for, right? Browser and um, the <coughs> hub for scrolling with the keyboard would be number one and everything else using the screen. Yeah, that's, that's the breakdown. At least when I had mine, I'm loving the classic still. I haven't... Haven't gone back to the broken screen of, of my passport quite yet, but uh, you know that's how it was for me too. Is as a little mix of both, especially because in some apps, especially like some Android apps, yeah. the passport keyboard wouldn't work or would partially work. Ultimately, what I found myself for scrolling, Chris, is you know I use the the, the shortcuts for top and bottom when yeah. I'm not really scrolling all too much. Also, I found that at least in terms of my use, when I had my passport and was using it regularly. 
you know, kind of how I had it in my hand also played a big point in how I would actually kind of interact with it. So if I was using it more in a one-handed way, I was more likely to use the keyboard to scroll without having to bring my thumb up a little higher. But if I have yeah. it in both hands, I may hold it in one hand and just scroll on the screen with the other. So. Yeah, absolutely. Like when I lay in bed, that's usually a one-handed use scenario because I'm laying on my side and I'm scrolling through web pages and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not... I'm not essentially reaching out to touch the screen at that point. I'm using the scroll on the keyboard. What the other the other interesting thing is that I do believe that we we ran a similar poll like way back when like the 9900 or something like that came out because people ran into what is essentially the exact same issue. You know, are you using the trackpad or are you reaching out and touching the screen yeah. on the icon? So yeah, at the core, it's it's. It's almost the exact same question again, just on a totally different operating system, even though it's still a BlackBerry. Mm, so totally, I, totally different hardware. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> exact same question. I have a question because you brought up um, like being on your phone in bed, like on your side, and this happens to me like every morning. I'll wake up and I'll be on my phone for probably you know thirty minutes to an hour, and I'm curious if you guys, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm curious if you guys ever. Within an app, do you do the double pull-down swipe um, to turn rotation lock on and off? Because normally when I'm toggling rotation lock, I'm on my side and I only have one hand on the device. So it's actually easier to minimize the app than pull down from the top and then click rotation because it's a one-handed thing. Where yeah. it's, so I, I find myself never using the two-hand pull-down because it's never convenient. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even trigger. Yeah, but, I usually just pull down and just hit the button up top and that's it. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm I don't want to have to do anything with two hands at that point. <laughs> yeah. Especially on like a one-handed type device, it's like I don't want to really have to, to go that extra. I mean, we had OS 10, 10.1, 10.2, 10.2.1. I learned to just minimize the app and swipe down from the top. It's it's habit at this point for me. Yeah. I love how this conversation is about how BlackBerry 10's compatibility with laziness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm chilling on my side. I'm here texting. <laughs> We work smarter, Jamey. We work smarter. Now. <laughs> I'm gonna mirror cast in my TV across the room and just text. <laughs> no swiping, no scrolling whatsoever. <laughs> but no, definitely a cool poll. I'm glad he put it up there. I was interested to see the results because it is a, a pretty valid question in terms of, you know, how people are interacting with their devices. Yeah, so absolutely. Definitely cool to see that. I want to give just a, some quick props over to Dahlin. He did a fantastic article over on BerryFlow, basically doing a full review of a Moto X 2014 and then comparing it to his previous experiences with BlackBerry 10. Uh, definitely check that out if you're interested kind of in Android where Lollipop is at in terms of BlackBerry 10. It is a fantastic kind of run through. He even throws some punches at Android toward the end in terms of some, thing, some of the things he didn't like. So definitely go ahead and check that out. We're going to go back to CES as we close out here. Day two coverage, there was a lot more to talk about in terms of different areas of BlackBerry that were getting announcements. Uh, Ronell, what was some of the stuff that they announced in terms of BBM at CES? I know that they were there and kind of demoing some stuff. Do you remember what it was? Um, on the top of my head, no. I know there was a couple in terms of numbers and active users, a little update there. Um, also with the smartwatch, which, I mean, I don't have one as of yet. I got a Fitbit, but... Having VM on my hand is actually seems like a really good idea to me. I mean, that would make me probably want to buy a smartwatch that much more. Um, but the smartwatch is a, a good move, and I think that's I think they were talking about that a couple weeks ago in terms of BlackBerry working with um, wearables. I think that's what they're talking about, like integrating their BBM and maybe other services to be controlled through a watch, right? So definitely a good move for them. You know, speaking of Fitbit, I'd love a BBM connected Fitbit app. So it just like updates my BBM status with like a daily count of how much I've walked. I think that'd be sick. J that's Jubei, when that's you start my problem with all yeah. of these wearables that were coming out, unfortunately, a lot of them don't necessarily seem to be compatible with BlackBerry 10 in the way that we would like. Yeah, yeah you can download some Android apps, and some of them may work, and some of them may not. Of course, there's also third party developers working with you know, like Pebble and stuff like that, to be able to go ahead and create some integration there, but it's still not at the peak that I would really like, which is, you know, that that portion of it is rather unfortunate. I'd like to see more integration, and if, if BlackBerry is 
you know, working on BBM and bringing some of that stuff in, then I think they should probably work on some of the other stuff as well. Like, if they could, if they can get BBM on Android Wear, then why can't we get BBM on, like, a Pebble or something like that while using a BlackBerry, right? Yeah. I totally agree. I think the films with them, um, they're trying to work on, um, or I don't know, it's not official, but Android Wear is a part of Olipop. I believe it's built in, so if that runtime would be brought to BlackBerry 10 in the near future, that would Hopefully that would help a lot with compatibility issues, right? Yeah, or even if they just, you know, opened up some of the APIs that are available on BBM for some developers to go out and go ahead and you know play around with it and see what they can do with it. But yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. inside yeah. baseball and behind the door stuff. So mm-hmm. give, give the, if you give developers hooks, they will put fish on them. You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Now, Jubei, when you had spoken with uh, with Sims previously, had he talked about anything like an interest in wearables in terms of BBM? Like, I, I, I'm trying to find like where the value proposition is. Is it to make right. BBM like like more I visceral tried, an experience, or I haven't really analyzed the whole situation because when I spoke to Sims, uh, he did express that they are looking into um, expanding BBM into wearables. At the time, you know, statistically, not many people are using wearables. That like smartwatches, no one's really buying them. Uh, I think a lot of consumers are kind of on the fence with it. A lot of these shows are um, trying to push it. Um, I, you guys are already know how I feel about smartwatches. I think they're like <laughs> ATVs. They're not going to mean anything. Um, yeah. But it's cool to see that um, they're willing to expand BBM. I wish they expanded more on their own um, app, <laughs> as far as like BBM <laughs> channels. Um, I want to see BBM channels uh, evolve more. Um, but you know, they're looking at the trends. That's a that's a good sign that they're actually looking at trends. They're 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 they're, they're they got their research and you know development team there, um, trying to keep up or maintain you know, that edge. But how many people are actually going to download BBM on their smartwatch? And then use it daily, you know? I mean, use it daily. But then that goes back to my first question, like, how many people are actually going to use smartwatches to, you know, (laughs) for those purposes? So... It sounds like such a good idea. It just feels so nascent at this point. Like, the smartwatch doesn't give me yet what I actually want from a smartwatch. You know, it doesn't. It's it's a additive, not an enhancing experience. That's half. Yeah, that's half of it because the other half obviously is costs. How much are these watches costing? Maintenance, security, all these different things. So um, I don't know. Consumers are still kind of eh, on it, but it's great to see that if they do pull the trigger on it, you know, BBM will have some representation in that market. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's like still, it, it's still early days for wearables. We're only like going into like, it, I guess realistically, you could say like the second generation of wearables because last year, at keeping in line with the CES discussion, uh, last year was all about wearables as well. This year, everybody who had a wearable had time to go ahead and refine it. There was a lot less wearables at CES this year, but. You know, they, they still have those products out there. They're still working on them, and, you know, the wearables aren't going to stop. It's just that, you know, nobody has found the perfect situation, and unfortunately, Apple's probably going to be the ones that end up taking a lot of the market share away from Maybe. everybody else. That's probably. Uh, I, 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 it's funny you mentioned that, uh, Chris, because I was just about to say that, like, I don't think people are going to take wearables in, in terms of smartwatches. They're not going to take it seriously until Apple drops on the market. And it's just, I mean, it's just like they didn't take the tablet serious until the iPad came out. And the funny thing is, is that when it just, it comes to those things is because I think Apple really just sits back. They pay attention to what's happening. They look at the flaws and not to say that the first iteration of that device for them doesn't bear a lot of flaws. It's just that they kind of get, they're the closest thing to getting it right the first time. Uh, especially when it comes to entering like a you know new part of the market, so to speak, and so I think once we see how the i I don't know what is it, the Apple Watch, the iWatch, whatever it is, uh, then I think that's when we're going to see something more. Because I mean, you, you'll 
you're definitely going to see, you know, uh, BlackBerry take BBM, you know, to to its platform, and uh, you'll see it there. But yeah, over this next year, mm -hmm. we'll see, you know, more of a, uh, you know, ex expansion upon the wearables in terms of applications, in terms of um, integration with with smartwatches. And, maybe, maybe uh, not. I mean, I think that the fact that wearables are in in straight limbo land right now is because the market doesn't know what the next big thing is and they're trying to force us to believe it's something like wearables. Um, yeah. Everyone right now is looking for the next in the wave of innovative um, products and by default I think wearables is it because this is really nothing else really going on. I mean Google tried with the glasses and the oculus thing and they're trying but all these things are just not happening. Yeah, no, I think Google is too, like, honestly, the Google Glass, that's definitely too futuristic, where not like it's crazy, crazy technology. It is pretty crazy technology, but I don't think we're going to be at a time and place where people actually accept it and will even find it normal in our current, you know, generation, right now and today. Five years from now, it might just be more normal, and then that's where it can catch on. But it's also not going to catch on at fifteen hundred dollars. Like no one's going to buy it. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it's going to get to the point where we're going to start integrating stuff within our body. So it's like people who wear glasses being able to have smart glasses, just replacing them. Like that's just a natural progression. And then the next thing comes, we're going to get um, eye implants to make our vision better. And like you could zoom in on shit. I don't know. Or I, have, I, like, can't wait, pop I can't wait till we're doing an upstream and uh, Alex is actually speaking through an actual Bluetooth. So that'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cool. robot Alex. Alex, <laughs> Alex would be awesome when he's doing something. But, you know, I was tapped into this robot that looks like Alex just sitting there. <laughs> Alex, hi guys, what's up? <laughs> Alex had brought up a good point because when you're talking about, you know, like in terms of price, you don't want to afford it. But also, it's kind of like when you look at like a bunch of like the wearables, it, it kind of looks like. It's too geeky. It's not something you're really going to wear with your everyday appearance until you see someone like Motorola and how they did their smartwatch where it actually looks something like, I could wear this and it can go with my appearance. It yeah. doesn't. You wouldn't even uh, appeal to it as a smartwatch. You would think it was a regular watch. So I think that also plays a large part. Yeah, yeah there's definitely a fashion yeah, sensibility yeah. And, element. And as, yeah. you be, as you really said, you know, it, it's one of those things also where it's kind of like, you know, we're all wondering where is going to be, where the next trend is going to be in terms of the, the the mobile space. But I think it's also going towards where we can use applications at. Um, I think BlackBerry. We can go back to Q and X. I think BlackBerry Next wants to get in homes. They want to get with home appliances and things of that nature. You know, cars has already been conquered, so let's move into, you know, the household now, into your everyday space. That's essentially what you want to be, and that's how the Internet of Things works. But it's just, it, it's so open, we, we really don't know. But I think the true innovation comes to just the convenience of how you use your, of how you function in terms of your everyday lifestyle. Like, yeah, I, it, it's just... I think it's where it's at. I, I mean, I've brought it up before, I think, in other upstreams where, like, this stuff is definitely going to be happening with Amazon, you know, messing around with this next day delivery or same day delivery on, like, vegetables or food or whatever. It's going to get to the point where we're going to have a smart refrigerator and we're going to have our Amazon account linked to it. And, you know, if, if Amazon or uh, if the refrigerator knows that we're eating, you know, this much broccoli a day or if we're drinking two beers a day and we have a six pack in there, after the second day, it's going to know that you have two beers left and you're going to drink those two beers in that day. So it's going to, Amazon is going to ship you a six pack of beers and just charge your Amazon account. Like it's going to get to the point where they're going to read us so well that we're not even going to have to think and we're going to be doing stuff that we need to do. Without thinking, and that's really where it's gonna. That's really what hey, James, IoT is. We, I just, think. Uh, we got the title for this upstream. We're gonna call it broccoli and, and beer. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to tell Alex, like, yo, I got people for that shit. Like, <laughs> Chris, what are some of those numbers that we have on BBM? I know they put out a lot out there. Ronell had mentioned it a little bit earlier. Oh uh, yeah. So while we were talking here, I ended up actually pulling them up. So um, they had essentially two slides that they put up. Uh, BBM in 2014 and the BBM audience. So uh, BBM in, four, in 2014, 140 million plus new registrations on iPhone and Android. Uh, 150,000 BBM or 150,000 daily BBM voice calls were placed. Over 1 million BBM channels were created. Over 300 million BBM stickers were shared. By accident. 
Yeah. <laughs> half of at them were at least Galvax. For God's sake. The other half were in Galvax. I'm about to say at least half of them. Wait, so Darius, was... When Darius is a sticker, he does like eight. Yeah. <laughs> I, but you know, sometimes I do that on purpose. But... Yeah. Sometimes. There was 175 million, obviously plus, because we're past everything now, but 175 million monthly visits to the BBM shop. Over 400 million daily BBM ad requests. Not entirely too sure what that means. Maybe it actually means impressions, like ad impressions that were sent out. Yeah, um, right. We, we showed ads to this many people. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting because I don't necessarily get that many ads on my BBM. I get, like, the BBM shop ones, and I think maybe I had one random one for, like, some Android app or something like that, which in itself was rather weird. Like, it literally made me go to Google Play. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So maybe it may be forward-looking. Yeah. So, uh, moving on it, to... It, the loads, it loads the Google Play that's been hacked on. To <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of growth and uh, highly engaged users, 185% growth in Android and iPhone user base in 2014. Uh, 70% daily active users and monthly active users. So uh, what that breaks down to is 7 in 10 users are active daily. And when it comes to, uh, you know, messages delivered and read, 8 seconds is the average time that it takes for someone to, uh, you know, deliver and read an actual message on their device. That's really nuts. And I'm probably skewing those numbers because I'm terrible at replying back to messages, but <laughs> that's the average, eight seconds. That's, that's me, though. Like, <laughs> I, I leave our chat open so that when the message comes in, it's automatically read. No. <laughs> it definitely some cool numbers for BBM. I like that they're focusing a lot on the cross-platform potential as opposed to talking about what's in core BlackBerry in terms of the user yeah. base and the new registrations. So cool to see that. There's there's kind of an additive question here that was from our BBM channel, and it's it's directed at you, Chris, in terms of CrackBerry and with with the news being positive recently for BlackBerry, whether that has been seen over for you and CrackBerry in terms of users signing up and overall engagement. Have, do, you, do you see the site kind of go up and down as BlackBerry News does as well? Yeah, I mean, we've we've essentially been that way for as long as I can remember. It, I've been with CrackBerry for seven years, uh, seven years and six months, actually, to put a specific number on it. I looked the other day because I was kind of surprised myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, when when there's good news, when there's device releases, you know, registrations goes go up, interest level goes up, and then you know, once things start to uh, you know, die off a little bit, then it just sort of levels off, and then it goes up again when brand new devices come out and more, you know, information comes out. Realistically, when you, when you actually look at the at the, and this may essentially blow some people's minds, but when it comes down to it, um, leaks, device leaks, um, device OS leaks, stuff like that they realistically don't generate that much traffic. The actual traffic comes from the help and how-to articles, ringtones, believe it or not, and like <laughs> wallpapers and stuff like that. When you, when you post essentially like a device leak or an OS leak or anything like that, that's not long tail traffic. Those people aren't necessarily coming back on a regular basis. They were there, they got their stuff, and they left. The real people are the ones that, you know, they just basically they want to know more. They want to know how to use their device. They want to discuss their device with other people. They want to essentially, like I said, learn more about it, how to use it, and just all that stuff. So when it comes down to it, the help and how-to is like the long tail stuff that people are actually really interested in. That's what they're out there searching for. That's what they're out there interested in and looking for on a daily basis. So. Um, that's where the majority of the traffic comes from. People just wanting to learn more about their device. But yeah, like you can, when it, when the news is good, registrations go up, and you can see the traffic go up. When news is bad, traffic is going down. <laughs> the good thing is that it 
the people that do sign up, they generally stick around and they stay around, you know, whether it be on like a regular basis or just a casual basis. They don't necessarily go anywhere. They they stay there. They may not visit as often, but they're still there and they're still logging in and still checking things out, even if they're not interactive on the forums. Like um, when the passport uh, came out, there was a lot of users that would they they essentially signed up like they lurked around the forums forever for like four or five years. But when the passport came out, they wanted to essentially go ahead and sign up because the passport was a new type of device, obviously, and they didn't know how to necessarily use it. It was different. They wanted to learn more about it, and they had questions that they didn't necessarily have the answers for. So rather than just lurking around and reading things, they just signed up and started asking their own questions. And that's so what hopefully that answers some of the what whoever was asking. Yeah, Sean, Sean asked. <laughs> I think you hit it right across the head and then again and again. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is cool to see that there is kind of an ebb and flow to it, so to speak, in terms yeah. of the, the user base is active and looking at those things. It's very cool, very cool. Let's go back and talk. We'll close on a CES. Only two, two more real bits of news to, to discuss. BlackBerry did unveil a roadmap and basically the foundational elements of their IoT platform. I thought it was a very interesting announcement overall. They're talking about it being very scalable, um, obviously being able to extend the best of what BlackBerry has in a portfolio perspective out to various different customers, developers, retailers, carrier fronts, manufacturers, in the regulatory industries and as well in insurance and really focusing on the core foundation of what BlackBerry has been offering as part of BES 12 and some of their other offerings, but in a combined way, in a scalable way, through QNX and through their IoT platform. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that can be a moneymaker for BlackBerry years on end? What kind of customers do you think they're going to need to be able to bring over? Darius, what are some of your thoughts on it? Um, I mean, look, looking into the future, because... Well, I mean, we had talked about uh, the 60-minute the segment with Nant Health and how they had, and we just... We got excited off the potential. We got excited off of what we knew that BlackBerry was kind of securing for the future in terms of breaking into the uh, the, the the health um, spectrum of things. When you look at it, it's kind of one of those things that you're glad they're kind of getting their foot first in the door. And <coughs> overall, what we'll, I feel like what we'll be seeing is uh, a major compliance in terms of customers and the relationship that they want to have, like doctors. So. When you have like these uh, medical establishments, hospitals, uh, doctors who have their own private practices and things of that nature, that's going to be that flood of customers that they're going to start bringing in. That's what they want to try to secure immediately. But they have to educate them on that first. Um, with the IoT platform, it's just connection around the world with just medical. Um, I think in terms of like production, whether it be moving food from coast to coast, anything of that nature, it's just across the board. It's Something that I really feel like BlackBerry right now is kind of getting their foot not just wet in, but they're they're deep in the game now. But well, uh, I mean, it's I just also great timing, right, Darius? Because right. You, we, we, we just finished, uh, or we're still Sony, and their big hacking nightmare problem that's been going on for weeks on end. Right. And BlackBerry's name has come up. So uh, I, it's just great timing to see that CES comes along and BlackBerry can introduce this IoT. It's interesting they didn't announce the name Project Ion um, like they used to. Now it's just IoT. So mm -hmm. wondering if they have a name for that or what exactly they're going to move as far as uh, identification. But um, it's just great timing to see um, in contrast what's going on in the real world because you know, what happened with Sony has happened to Home Depot, it's happened to eBay, it's happened to Target, it's, ca it's happened to a number of businesses. So uh, BlackBerry introducing this new uh, infrastructure on a global scale securely where it manages all this data. Um, I forget the number, but it's like, I don't know how many petabytes it was. 35 petabytes of mobile data a month. Alex, <laughs> tell us what a one petabyte is. Oh, here we go. Isn't it? <laughs> I think it would be a thousand terabytes. How many? <laughs> oh, man. Wait, wait, wait! You ain't got your calculator open. Come on. Hold on. Oh yeah, I'm right. No, I'm not. Yeah, I am. Yes, I am. Sweet. I just learned that today. Okay. Um, so there's a thousand megabytes 
in a gigabyte, and then there is a thousand gigabytes in a terabyte, and then there's a thousand terabytes in a petabyte. So how many petabytes? Thirty-five. Okay, so thirty-five. 35. That would be equivalent to thirty-five thousand terabytes, which would be thirty-five million trillion gigabytes. <laughs> thirty-five million <laughs> gigabytes. <laughs> this is like <laughs> yeah. so amazing. Now, this is that 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 number is what BlackBerry manages now, and it's across three hundred mobile operators and four hundred different networks. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, this is a little beyond, at this point, getting their feet wet. They are positioned now to be the global leader in this Internet of Things because right. they understand that now everything is becoming more intelligent. But who's going to manage all that sensitive data and the transferring all of it? And BlackBerry now is coming in and saying, we are. So uh, This is where I think they're essentially uniquely available for this situation because if you if you listen to all of the other announcements regarding IOT which let's I have to say it it's probably one of the stupidest acronyms ever and one of the worst things like I'm I'm so <laughs> sick of hearing IOT that it's unbelievable but beyond that now that we got that out of the way <laughs> if you listen to all of the other announcements regarding IOT Everybody wants to be the person who is going to go ahead and connect you to your home, to your living room, to your car, to everything else like that. But BlackBerry has, has taken the position that they don't necessarily want to be the one who is in your house or in your living room. They want to be the ones that are powering what all of these companies are putting out. You know, It's almost like a Q&X scenario because... As we mentioned, the QNX name isn't necessarily out there, and they're kind of like behind the scenes when it comes to the automotive industry. And basically, BlackBerry wants to be somewhat behind the scenes in the IoT industry because they don't right. they, they they just want to be the secure network that like Samsung or HTC or whatever whoever is actually using. They want to be the ones to secure that data along that pipeline. Now they do. They do have their own implementations. Let's not, you know, deny them that because you know they've ventured into the shipping industry, which is one of the situations that they have up and running. They they sort of like beta test it, and they did uh, the boxes, the shipping boxes, to for logistic tracking and stuff like that. So you know. As an example, this isn't necessarily it, but as an example, if FedEx was shipping stuff overseas, they know exactly where that container is. They know how much it weighs, whatever the case may be, how much product is on board, whatever the case may be. Um, they know all of that stuff just by these little boxes that they have, or transponders, I guess you could say, relaying all of that information back across the IoT network that BlackBerry is putting in place. So they have all of that stuff. Wait, and it, like I said, it, it's totally different from what everybody else is doing because they want to be the ones that are behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. and that, they want, that's they want to be the, plat the platform behind the platform. You know? Yeah, exactly. You know, let's say, let's say for just as an example, if Samsung wanted Home Connect or some other silly name, they want to be the ones that that data, your personal information, actually travels over. They want to know when my refrigerator is empty and I need beer or broccoli, <laughs> and they want to transfer <laughs> that information to Amazon. You know. <laughs> So it, it's it's entirely different from what everybody else is doing in regards to IoT, and I think they're uniquely positioned for that because of the fact that they, you know, they have all of this data already flowing. They have all of these networks in place, 300 carrier, and you know, 400 mobile operators across the Y, across the world. Uh, you know, why not utilize it? It just it seems like a great spot for them to be. Global, yeah. global secure network. Leveraging it is going to be vital. It seems kind of like they want to bring life to the IoT. It's been yeah, like yeah. kind of this this dead term that's been kind of pandered around the last like four or five years, really. Yeah. And it's kind of cool. I saw that they were kind of working on like life cycle management, being able to yeah. say, like, all right, we're bringing a, pl a product into market in 2015, and by 2020, we're still going to be able to support it. So we can actually control the full life cycle with updates over the air. 
you know, really help these OEMs help refine what they're bringing into vehicles or other in-field uh, types of devices. Yeah. Lots of cool stuff. So I can I, I can read off parts of this now. Let's be perfectly honest. I don't necessarily understand every single thing that is on here and how it could possibly be implemented. However, they when it comes to the IoT platform, they want device collection, they want lifecycle management, they want device management, they want federated identity, permissions, analytics, storage, security, regulatory, um, carrier import, which goes back to, um, for example, like the, the ships. Um, they want buyer and retailer, so, you know, if, um, if you're buying 20 Blackberries, they want to know exactly who's buying those Blackberries and what retailer it's coming from. And of course, they have uh, have it open for developers and stuff like that as well. Uh, you can go to BlackBerry forward slash IoT to learn more. I want to read a qu quick quote to close off here. This is a quote from Is it Chinakescu, the new BST business platform uh, division uh, president? Really cool. Chen had brought him on. He says BlackBerry is combining its QNX platform, which powers systems in cars and industrial applications with its secure network, for which the company and its messaging service have long been known. And the quote is, we own every component of the entire chain. And again, keeping with the same methodology of BES 12, where it's a full solution end-to-end. -end. We're not slapping it on here on one end of the equation. We've got the full circle in terms of security in the platform. And as Chrissy had mentioned, Everyone else just wants to put a device and connect it to the internet. You know, we've been doing that for a while, right? The internet, the internet of Things is here, but being able to really do that on a platform scale with the scalability and reliability that BlackBerry is able to offer is ultimately where BlackBerry's Project Ion or IoT platform are going to come into place. Lots of lots of cool stuff in terms of IoT. Lots of cool stuff in terms of devices. What did you guys think of AT and T's announcements uh, in terms of their newly redesigned? Uh, BlackBerry Passport. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a contention point for some. B before this before this whole thing starts off, because this could be like a long debate or whatever, um, I want to speak off of what you just said, James, about the security aspect of it all. Um, because CES, if you guys watched it, a lot of cool stuff was coming out where, you know, you can start your car with your phone, and then you can actually share your phone, or your like your keys to your car to your buddy's phone, so he can start your car from his phone within an app, or like it's like you literally don't need car keys anymore, and you could actually send requests for people to drive your car or whatever. It's like insane. But now we're getting at the point where okay, now we have to worry about hackers simply hacking into my car, and they can drive my car away. They don't need my physical key that I have in my pocket. They could just stand next to my car, hack my car, drive my car away. So security, I think, is one of these things that. We've mentioned so many times, you don't even think about it until you get hacked. Um, but like now when our lives are going to be so intertwined with technology moving forward, security is going to become so much more important than any of us are even thinking. So I think it's just really, I think BlackBerry, we're at a great time right now. And we might not even see the effects of it for a few years. But just kind of want to bring that up and remind people. I, That's I, essentially I, the other part, too, is like a lot of this stuff, I mean, we're... We don't necessarily know what they're doing, and we may not even necessarily understand a lot of what they're doing. So, you know, it's it's realistically, it's kind of hard to cover a lot of that stuff if you don't necessarily know exactly what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're doing it, and you know, there has to be some sort of result there at some point in time, and hopefully that will be, you know, reflected in the earnings reports by them actually making a lot more money than what they're doing now. So. I defend BlackBerry almost daily in terms of what they offer. You know, yeah. people are like, oh, BlackBerry devices are dead, their services are dead, their operating systems are dead. And it's like, well, no, they're actually quite big in medical and automotive still, you know. You, yeah. you may overlook that one key aspect of BlackBerry, but there's a lot more going on with this new BlackBerry. You know, RIM was one thing, BlackBerry is another. Um, it's kind of interesting when we talk in terms of IoT and QNX that BlackBerry really is at the cusp. I've said this kind of uh, kind of illusion before, where I feel like Apple and Samsung are leading the edge in terms of actually bringing these products and NFC and all this these different things to the forefront in the mainstream. 
they're leading that edge, but BlackBerry is cutting that edge. They're literally right there, actually making the cut, putting pressure against it, and really innovating in terms of software services and, of course, the platform behind all those things. Definitely a lot of cool stuff out of CES, a lot of stuff on the automotive, IoT, a little bit of stuff about Nant Health as well. They announced this new piece of equipment called the H-Box. The uh, H-Box. Right, it sounds like, like smallpox or something that's going to kill you, but it actually does the exact opposite, at least in concept. It's a cloud-based uh, technology that combines science with big data to transform healthcare. I mean, that's, that's the general summation of it, right? This is a device that is, can be connected to your different medical pieces of equipment, be connected hardline to a dialysis machine wirelessly through the carrier to a Fitbit type device and it can securely transmit your data between patient, doctor, and hospital. So you've kind of got a full real-time statistics and views on different life uh, style choices that people are making. I found that insurance companies are actually they'll, they'll give you an insurance discount if you're active on a Fitbit, just like a healthy life insurance discount, things oh, of that nature. So you, can, you can imagine kind of the scope of all of this. If you're talking insurance, regulatory, a lot of different areas where having a, a piece of equipment like this running QNX can really help kind of unify your life. You're going to have people hiring out to wear their Fitbit so they could eat like a fat ass, and they're going to have someone else wear their Fitbit, so insurance companies give them better rates. <laughs> this is, oh, this is what dogs are oh, for. Oh, black market, yeah. <laughs> this is what pets are for. This my dog oh, I need some in and out burger. Wear my Fitbit for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You'd be surprised, man. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We've got body area networks, people putting patches on that can tell you predetermine a heart attack and things of that nature. Lots of cool stuff, and, and at least BlackBerry's there, you know. They are leading the edge. They're not talking about venturing into medical. It's we've been doing medical, you know, for the last, you know, um, umpteen years. So definitely QNX and their neutrino is doing a lot toward that end. So we, we got some news in regard of Classic coming to AT&T mid-February, talking about as well a unique passport with rounded edges. Have any of you guys seen the images Ronell, I'm interested in some of your thoughts from a perspective because you were telling us on previous upstreams that when you're in the store and you're telling someone about a passport, that they were like, eh, it's too big. I want something a little bit smaller. And a lot of people comment on the rounded edge passport and they're like, is it smaller? Is it, you know? It, it looks at least a little bit more amenable, a little bit more ergonomic to users. If you were to be selling an AT&T curved edge passport, do you think it would find more pros or more cons? What are your thoughts, Ronell? Uh, personally, uh, and when I think about it, it would probably be the same because it doesn't matter if it's got round corners or, um, not sorry, round corners versus how the real password is now, it's, it's still that, it's still wide, right? And that's the major thing which a lot of consumers, which I try to sell to, found as a big, um, no-no in terms of, uh, choosing a phone, uh, that they want to buy, right? So, I mean... It's more of a look choice, like it looks better than the other one, but it's not something that would make people buy it more than versus the original uh, passport, in my opinion. It's just a look change. It's right? confusing for me how people can kind of quantify that for themselves. It's like, this is wide, but this is not. Like, <laughs> you know, this is so tall in your pant pocket, you know, like this is obscene. To put it, like, this is the size of my leg, you know? <laughs> I'm a short guy, but I find this fits a lot better, the Passport, in my pocket than something like this does, like a Node or, a, or an LG View. But it, I guess it is like you said, Ronell, it's going to kind of come down to that user preference. Blackberry, if you are out there listening, I'd love you to make a rounded edge red version. I think that'd be hot. <laughs> I definitely would review that device for you. <laughs> <laughs> Darius, what about you? In terms of an AT&T passport, you were talking to me a little bit earlier that you're excited. Not not necessarily for the passport device, but for the presence of BlackBerry products at AT&T. Talk about well, it a little bit. I mean, it's, it's good to have a refresh, and it's good to have uh, a resurgence, if you will, by BlackBerry. Um, and it's not just AT&T. You really want it to be a you know, carrier-wide. Um I just start off with like the passport, you know, having rounded edges. I think the only pro you can kind of see with it is, I suppose rounded edges would be a bit more comfortable in your hand opposed to, you know, the, the square edges that the original design of the passport gives off. You appreciate the original design the passport gives as well because you understand that inspiration behind it um, with the passport launch. Um, one thing I do like about it, as I mentioned to, you know, a few guys is that 
I like the the stainless steel around all the all the way around the uh, passport. Um, AT and T's variant, I should say. Um, that is one thing that I do like. But you know the I don't know. I guess it's more the little bottom piece that's underneath the keyboard. It, it just looks a little wide, so that kind of gives off like a a cheap look, if you will. Even with the back of it, I don't even think it's as nice as the original passport. But at the same time, I, I mean, we we all understand. I don't want to say we all do, because some people really don't understand what AT and T's <laughs> purpose of kind of redesigning it was. It, it's really it kind of gives more of a. Uh, a commitment off the bat, if you will, for consumers when they see the device, opposed to the original design. And because I, I guess more with uh, rounded edges, a, a one-handed um, usage is it, a little bit more allotted, but I don't know. It's a love-hate thing with me. I, I love the simple fact that we're finally seeing this Passport in the Classic on AT&T, but um, as we mentioned, I'm, I want to see the Classic and the Passport, for that matter, on Sprint, on T-Mobile, you want to hear the announcement with Verizon. You don't want to just hear it with AT and T because it's been said for so long. It's like hurry up and you know release it already. So it's kind of like rounded edges has caused so much pain for the last couple months, and it sucks. But um, I don't know. It, it's it's one of those things. I just hope that there's 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 good well being that's come that comes forth from it. You know that's that's honestly I don't even give a damn about what shape it is. It could be like rectangle for all I care. As long as I know. <laughs> Is that there is a BlackBerry, and it's coming to AT and T. So what difference does it make? Right. That's gotta make some people happy in the end. Whoever's buying it, y'all buy it. Buy the classic. So, buy so the you, so you guys don't see it as a we weren't confident in our original design mentality and philosophy. No, oh, hell no, no, no hell no. AT and T <laughs> has the habit of screwing with devices, anyways. Yeah, exactly. They've always messed with devices. They've been messing with devices for like at least ten years, man. They always want a custom version. I don't know if y'all remember, but back when like there, back when Windows Mobile was like the hottest thing, there was. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had to <laughs> but they messed with all the devices. Like yeah. they always wanted either the shape changed, or they wanted the OS changed, or whatever. They wanted the name changed, like the AT and T. Uh, tilt, which was previously called the a HTC right. Titan, yeah, and it landed on pretty much every other carrier as the HTC Titan, but they wanted to rebrand it the AT and T Tilt, and they wanted to go ahead and change it. They've always done it. They have a history of it, and I don't, I don't see why this is any different. I don't see, you know, like BlackBerry didn't say, oh, we screwed up on the original design. I think it's, it's just AT and T being. AT and T, they've they've always done it. It's BlackBerry doing what they got to do to get in bed with AT and T. Yeah, I mean you that, know? that too. You exactly. know, that that's that's probably like fifty percent of it, and the other fifty percent is AT and T just being AT and T. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, cool. You can get the devices, both Classic and Passport, for zero down on AT and T Next. Otherwise, for no annual commitment on Classic, you can get it for four ninety nine. If you get it on AT&T's Next, you can get it for seventeen fifty or twenty one, based on how many months you want to pay out on that. For classic, I mean, for Passport, excuse me, you can get it for about uh, twenty seven dollars a month and or thirty two, depending on your monthly commitment, and outright for six fifty. So, Shop BlackBerry still an awesome choice. You can get a red one right now for cheaper outright than you can at AT&T. Um, Right now, yeah, Chris is rocking his. Man, that device is so nice. It kills me. Beautiful. Absolutely oh. is. Absolutely is. <laughs> Lots of fun stuff from CES. I mean, we didn't expect a lot of device chit chat or things of that nature. So the fact that they had AT and T there as well to talk about how they're going to be supporting these devices and supporting them in the carrier stores, definitely positive. I mean, they rode the fact that. QNX has basically killed CES. You know, they were all over with different cars, showing off different things yeah. and, and different cool innovations that they were able to ride some of that hype. I think is real positive for them and able to I mean, claim. There, there, there was even a lot of stuff there that like none of us could capture because you know there was just so much of QNX that was actually there. I mean, we had, we had our own team on ground, but they couldn't capture all of that stuff. So we had to deal with just like the press releases and such. So. <laughs> I, I feel like there's kind of we're going through a time where it's kind of confusing of like what people really want. For instance, like CES this year, I feel like was a lot of 
you know, 4K, 8K televisions, and then companies saying, you know, OLED is where it's at on a TV, and, like, OLED has been around for smaller screens, but maybe now it's finally somewhat affordable, and then projectors giving off 4K and 8K, and I feel like the steps that we're taking don't really seem sensical. I, I'm not really sure. Like, are people just maybe confused as right. to what... Like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm right. just thrown off. No, 100%. I mean, even at, I went to a Sony convention last year, and they were making 4K TVs, and I don't know about America. I mean, Google's making Google Fiber in certain cities and whatnot. Here up in Canada, I mean, we can't support that type of bandwidth and yeah. type of data transfer just to get that 4K content to anybody. So what the hell do I need a 4K for? I mean, I know you can upscale a lot of stuff, but upscaling is still not the best. So what the hell are you making 4K yeah. TV without 4K content? You know, I mean, and then there's there's the curved screen, and now they're now they're letting you um, electronically make it somewhat curved or not curved. So it's like they, you used to have to buy a curved television last year, and now you get to choose if you want it to <laughs> like what angle of curvature you want now. And it's like I don't know. I just feel like a lot of this is kind of gimmicky, but they I feel like they just don't know where the innovation is, and I feel like bad like I really want to see more battery stuff, and I think it it's coming, but I don't know. Agreed. I think we finally caught up with the future. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, like years it's ago, scary, we, were, we were so long, we were so far off. But we finally caught up with it now. And, and it's now it's just a bunch of uh, gadget spam, as it has been the last couple of years. It's always cool to see, you know, the new latest, you know, things that come out. But um, I, think, I think you're right, except for there are certain areas that haven't caught up. Like uh, Ronald was saying, you know, you got a 4K TV. <laughs> But you ain't got no way to get that 4K content. <laughs> right. So what difference does it make? You know, you have a 4K TV that just looks pretty that's showing 1080p content. Great. Fascinating. You know, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have to spend like seven hours downloading 4K content just so I could watch it on my 4K TV. You know? 4K cables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 4K cable. <laughs> So I want to show off here, as we close out on our news for the day, we, Marco, our little resident designer, did do a mock-up here of the Passport 2. Uh, last upstream, we were talking, like, what could a Passport 2 possibly bring in terms of innovation, you know? Is it a new keyboard, another row? What what could we bring? And uh, Marco's kind of dreamed up a stylus. I think an all-touch Passport is, is such a cool thing. Because it's kind of like a like a third of a playbook, you know. They kind of cut a playbook in thirds and gave it back to you. I love these images. Love the renders Marco did here. I don't. Know, I'm not entirely sure how realistic they'd be in terms of actually seeing it come to fruition. But definitely really cool to see a device like this, especially one optimized uh, to use a stylus in terms of being able to charge and whatnot. You guys think we're gonna see an all-touch type device if it leans more toward the passport? Uh, passport ratio, or we're going to see something more in line with what we've seen on like the Z3 and or Rio. What do you guys want to see in terms of an all-touch? Something more like this, or something more traditional 16 by 9? 16 by 9. I'm yeah. waiting for it. Uh, my watch is it's got 16 by 9 on it. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, I think that the square passport ratio, like it's so fitting for having the physical you know, keys here, and I feel like this is still what people are going to choose for, like, an all-touch device. Um, it's, I don't know, I, I'm kind of torn on it. I know a lot of people really, really want it, but I still want the candy bar style for this, and I love the Passport for actual physical buttons. I don't know. I want them both. Just give them both to me. Yeah. See, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the ultimate scenario, because, yeah. you know, hmm. I true. personally want a Passport too. And, you know, probably take some of the concepts that Marco put in there. However, I know that the majority of people want a candy bar Z3 up, Z30 upgrade or whatever the case may be, you know, just a high-end all-touch device. You know, wouldn't happen to be that I see it every liner. single day, people yeah. demanding it. Like, if you don't give me this, I'm leaving. I'm going yeah, to iPhone. Yeah, I'm yeah, going yeah. to Android. It's like, all right. Yeah. They, need, they need to produce something. Like, to me, the Passport is absolutely amazing. And... You know, I didn't give a, give up my passport for the classic or anything like that. It's ideal for my use case scenario, but I'm not the majority, and I know that. The, right. the passport is still a niche device, and they need something that's going to, 
you know, get the the mass audience that that wants that full touch screen and you know get it out there and get it in their hands. And unfortunately, if this Rio ever happens to show up, that's not the device that people want. <laughs> No. It's, it's, it's it, a rehash. We all know it. And you know. R for rehash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the truth, though. I mean, we all want that hero phone, though. But, I mean, yeah. Jen said it himself. He said, you know, they want to go more vertical this year. Um, and th those devices will come. And we look forward to it. But I, I was, as months ago, I was excited already for the second iteration of the Passport before the first one even was out for release. And it's just, as Chris has mentioned, it's just like the Passport is that's a remarkable device. Just to tell you the fact that it didn't even get top tier specs that it deserved. Like, we didn't get an OLED screen. We got LCD. It's cool, but we don't get those true darks. You know, we didn't get the fastest processor, but it still is damn near flawless. And you have to accept that. So when you can sit here and say that they put out a device that is to that T, and it doesn't even have the best of the best, it only just saves that room for the anticipation for the next one to come. But, you know, of course, like, uh, you, they want the Hero Phone. They want the 16 by 9. They they want that. And that is the majority, and that's just what it is. It's uh, the standard, if you will, to tell you the truth. That's truly what it is. 16 by 9 is the standard with top specs and the latest OS that that platform is providing. So I, I think it's soon to come. So Hopefully we'll see it. I want to see it, and I'll use my upgrade on it. Other than that, I'll probably be just purchasing outright my next device. I want to see it so everybody else can stop asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we all fall, really. We right. just want to see it. We just want to have a spec list and be like, yeah, I'll wait for the next. You know, like when, when the classic <laughs> when the classic spec sheet came out, like half the team just wrote it wrote it off already. Like, oh, that's not for me. I'll wait for the next next device. Uh, those very few viewers who are regulars on the show, we have done, gone ahead and redone the entire front end of uh, Berry Flow, the website. See, our, we've got our banner up top here, focusing more on some of that premium content up top. Obviously, we're showcasing Berry Flow upstream here in the center. As well, we've got some testimonials and a little bit about what we do. And of course, we have a gorgeous girl here holding a passport showing off her creative side with the Berry Flow shirt as well. You can give her some kudos on her hair there as well. But check out the new site. Let us know how you like it uh, and how that works for you. We've kind of hidden the blog content off toward the back end. So it's going to be mainly distributed out through the channels and social media otherwise. So keep an eye. We've got some new content coming as well. Just started we also opened up a new Instagram account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so go go follow that if you're on Instagram. You know, we got that one photo that's worth seeing. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Instagram? Is it just Instagram Berry Flow? Yeah, it's BBRY Flow. Sweet. Yeah, I wish Instagram on desktop was better. The thing is awful, but you know, use the app. It'll get you there quick enough. I know the videos don't even play on like the desktop version, which is I don't fully understand that, but whatever. I just wish they had like. Um, even though it totally goes against the whole concept of Instagram, I just wish they had a desktop uploader. <laughs> yeah, that, that yeah, works. A couple hacked, hack apps for it, but whatever, they don't work right. Because I think Instagram even dumbs down resolution of pictures as well. So I think if you were able to upload like via desktop, you know, you can kind of say that resolution, yeah, the crisp, crispness of the photo. I've actually had like success watching videos on Instagram, but I don't know. Speaking of yeah, Instagram, I've actually been experiencing it's weird. It. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it just it's like screw you, get out of here. You ain't watching this video. <laughs> As a final teaser to all, I just got to see an application, a new native application for BlackBerry 10. Uh, it's under wraps for the next probable probably month, but it is a native application for a very big social app, and it oh. is it is awesome. It is awesome. You guys are really going to like it. So we'll leave that. We'll close out the show with that. Uh, maybe someone will leak it on some of their other sites, but uh, I'm tight-lipped for now. I got that, too, and I can't say who I got it from, but I got that, too. Right. It right. does look pretty damn good, too. It looks awesome. looks freaking awesome. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, maybe two, three weeks to toward a month we'll be seeing a little bit more on that. Maybe able to share a little something-something about it, but it does look quite good. It's Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
It's limber. Tap.net. <laughs> 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 It's Trello. Sorry, guys. That's what it is. Hey, don't laugh, man. I would kill for a Trello client. It, yo, hey, no, you kill for it. Chris, 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 Chris. My yeah. have good news. Here we go. Oh, and we're on air, so this is awesome. even better. Um, you know Cubo? Yeah. Cubo. He's. Um, I I just gave him a shout out last episode because he makes awesome apps. He has been working on a native Trello, um, for BlackBerry Ten. Oh, sweet. And he's doing. Yep, he's doing it totally free. He does not. He doesn't want to charge for it. He doesn't want to have in-app purchases, nothing. He's just doing it to do it. And last I heard from him, he was hoping, you know, mid-end of February he'd have it up. But, it's, yeah, so I cannot wait. I When he told me that, I was flipping out because he's yeah. been working on a buffer. He's, good. Um, he's a good developer because, he, like you said, he doesn't charge for his apps. He just wants to make everything better. Yep, he just wants he to help them. As, as, as long as people are happy and using his stuff. That's good. <laughs> Supposedly, the wine developer Bohan is also looking at trying to build a Trello app as well. So maybe they might collaborate and share that workload. Oh, damn. two awesome native app app developers who do it, do it for free. I mean, that's we can't ask for more, right? Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, appreciate having all of you guys on as well for another Berry Flow upstream. And I think next episode is going to be eight months for us on air, so that'll be cool. Maybe we'll. Yeah. Well, I was going to say we'll have a drink, but that's nothing special, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Chris, Alex, Darius, Jube, and Ronell, I really appreciate having you all on. Well, thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. We'll, we'll see you all next time. Later.